It's always exciting to find an old dump when you're walking through the woods. Um, our Victorian ancestors and on into the 20th century dumped their rubbish and unwanted items where they could. So you get these magical places where 100 or even 150 year old rubbish has been dumped and he's just here to discover. China, glass, metal items. Most people come and dig looking for complete things. Um, ginger beer bottles, stoneware bottles, glass bottles. But there's plenty of interest in what is left behind. In this video I'm going to look at particularly the pottery that you can find on old dumps. Uh, mostly Victorian uh, and we'll look at the three main classes of pottery that you're likely to encounter. That is earthenware, stoneware and porcelain and we get some tips on how to identify that, um, assign a rough age to it and also look at the different classes and styles that were produced in the second half of the 19th century. Classic Victoriana. Okay, we have a lovely table full of Victorian pottery, uh, which we will examine in a bit more detail now. Okay, you've been out and about and you have pottery, which you have found, but is it earthenware, stoneware or porcelain? Let's look at the differences between these three types of pottery. Earthenware is the most basic type of pottery and right through from when pottery was first introduced in the Neolithic period right up to the post-medieval period all pottery was earthenware which is just simply clay that has been fired. Um, distinguishing characteristics is often very sandy. Um, if it's going to hold liquids it has to be glazed. Um, ideal for decoration of various sorts. Uh, can be red clay, white bodied clay, um, it's very soft, you could scratch it with your fingernail um, and it's very dull sounding when you tap it against another piece of earthenware. Um, as earthenware is porous, that is it will let water in unless it's glazed. Um, it's often very discoloured when you find it in the ground because it's absorbed the dirt and water from its environment. But on a fresh break, you can see the original colour is very white and refined. Refined earthenware was made by adding ball clay or flint to the clay body and is first seen around 1740. So all the Victorian clay would normally be refined earthenwares, which are very white body, but obviously get stained very easily when they're broken. Stonewares. Um, so these are fired to a higher temperature so that the surface fuses and they are impervious to liquids without glazing. Although they often have a, a decorative glaze, they're often brown, um, they're very high, um, hard, um, you can't scratch them with your fingernail and if you tap them they ring like that as opposed to the dull sound that you get when you smack earthenwares together. So a huge number of stonewares are made, first invented by the Germans around 1300 and imported into this country soon afterwards, uh, made here from the 17th century onwards and huge numbers of stoneware vessels, often very utilitarian, were made in the Victorian period. The final class of pottery we're going to look at is porcelain, which is fired to a much higher temperature so that actually the whole body fuses uh, and it's almost like a sort of glass. So it's very glassy, very smooth. Um, it breaks with a conchoidal fracture, that is it's sort of um, like a glass bottle would break or chip at the edges. Um, but the main characteristic uh, is that it's translucent. So unlike ordinary earthenwares, 
um, porcelain and bone china are translucent that is you can see light through the body I mentioned bone china so there are two sorts of porcelains there's a hard body um, hard paste which was favoured by the oriental porcelain Chinese and Japanese uh, and continental factories so a lot of cheap imports at the end of the 19th century are made of hard paste porcelain uh, whereas the British preferred a soft paste porcelain or a bone china from about 1800 um, bone china um, was produced and from 1820 was the normal fabric for fine china dinner services tea services uh, soft paste porcelain um, has the same characteristics of porcelain but it's not quite harsh uh, looking it's a bit softer um, than the Chinese and continental porcelains so on a Victorian dump or Victorian finds what am I going to expect to find in earthenware well in its most simple form unglazed materials um, such as chimney pots or ubiquitous flower pots obviously with a single hole in the bottom uh, glazed um, red wares are the most humble class of earthenware uh, and the redware pottery is produced as well as things like bricks and tiles and flower pots also vessels just for the kitchen for storage for farm use for settling milk that sort of thing so a very common form is the pantheon uh, which is a wide bowl with slanting sides and has a simple roll top like that glazed on the inside only not on the outside and used for 101 kitchen and dairy uses you might also find slipware decoration on these redware vessels uh, this one's been glazed just over the rim but not underneath uh, and it's got slip which is a liquid clay just piped into a nice pattern there um, this is known as Sunderland type slipware although it was made at other places especially in Scotland um, but a lot was made in the northeast and these baking dishes are common finds they're quite distinctive made throughout the 19th century um, on a more buff coloured clay you get these Staffordshire type slipwares again these were made in other parts of the country uh, Bristol for example and um, these were made right through into the Victorian period uh, having started production in the 17th century uh, and the slip is just trailed and then feathered or mottled into nice patterns again they're normally unglazed underneath Baking dishes can be recognised by their crimped edges and this sort of Bakewell tart feathered decoration in slip is very commonly seen. Looking now at refined earthenwares, that is earthenware on a fine white clay body, the bulk of what you will find will be classic transfer printed um, so you engrave the copper plate make a tissue paper pull which is inked uh, place that onto your pot or dish and wash away the tissue paper and then the design is left on the plate it's glazed and fired so it's under the glaze um, obviously the willow pattern is a very famous type and you'll recognize even small pieces of that design uh, this one too wild rose border with Newnham Courtney house is another very popular design so a lot of transfer printed stuff ends up on dump sites um, 
it's easy to, to recognize whether things are transfer printed. Um, they are the same pattern produced again and again, mass produced. Uh, here you can see where they joined the pattern not very successfully, so there's a line where they've added one part of the pattern to another um, and added the tissue paper to it there. Um, so it's much more detailed and finer than hand painted. And you'll find this right throughout the period, Georgian and Victorian. Uh, a simple additional way of decoration was to place a transfer print on an item and then to colour it in with enamel, in other words, just painted decoration. This was often done by children as it's just like literally colouring in the lines uh, on the transfer printing. And again, quite a cheap way of making a design. So here we have transfer printed centre, moulded border, just highlighted with hand painting on enamels there. And of course, you can get plates which are completely hand painted. Um, flowers are very popular, obviously, um, and they're not necessarily expensive. Obviously, some fine chinas with landscape, portraits, etc., um, in hand painted by artists. But this was done very simply and very quickly, just ashes of colour, simple flowers. It was not very expensive, so you're likely to come across these uh, in a dump situation. Flow blue is where the design has deliberately been allowed to run. So you get this indistinct cloudy type of blue decoration. This was first introduced in the 1830s and was very popular up to the 1860s. Spongeware was very popular in the second half of the 19th century and was made, as it sounds, just by cutting a design in a sponge and repeating a pattern again and again. So you get a wide variety of patterns sponged there. Um, very popular in Scotland, but also made in other parts of the country, Staffordshire and Wales in the second half of the 19th century. And this was actually some of the cheapest china that you could buy. Um, and so it's often found even in the most humble crofts in Ireland and Scotland. And I love it. Majolica is a very distinctive type of urban ware, um, produced from the 1850s, very popular after the 1870s. Um, and it normally has a very vibrant colour scheme and moulded decoration, often there is a complementary colour inside and outside, um, especially pink. They seem to be very taken with pink decoration, um, lustrous clays and colours. How about this lovely jug? This was made to commemorate Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. That is in 18... 97 um, and this is a red body with a lustrous black glaze um, decorated with a gold transfer print and blobs of colour red white and blue very patriotic so some people term this jackfield ware um, but that's incorrect because um, that's an 18th century product um, this is jet ware which was popular after 1875 uh, and you can see the lustrous black glaze and the blobs of painted enamel decoration there on a red clay body. Often you get marked pieces with crests and the names of organisations. This is a military plate for the sergeant's mess of the 42nd regiment that's the black watch um, from the 1880s onwards um, but you get obviously things marked for schools hospitals prisons cafes restaurants ships 
uh, the Navy, the Army, uh, and they're very interesting to do research on, especially if you have a local piece um, to look at. Earthenwares are very common as packaging for foods, preserves, and other Victorian essentials. Um, James Keeler of Dundee, marmalade, his must have been produced in their millions. Frank Cooper of Oxford. And again, these are very nice to find um, and very collectible. Uh, another thing is pot lids and pot bases, pot lid bases, uh, which were used for a variety of different um, lotions and toothpastes and food paste um, in the Victorian period, very popular from the 1880s up to the First World War. Um, special earthenware was made for children as well, especially plates and mugs that often had um, inscriptions on them, uh, often a daisy border or moulded border of some sort and a transfer printed centre. And these are always charming finds, the Victorian children with their toys. Miniatures as well, doll's house furniture uh, for children to play with, teapot, all these chamber pots, the family physician, and this little doll's house chamber pot says, after you, my dear. This is probably a German one uh, in hard paste porcelain. Another very common dump find is uh, Rockingham glaze. So it's this brown treacle glaze, um, which is very commonly found on teapots. So sort of buff coloured clay and a very thick treacle brown glaze. Uh, and these two teapots and teapot lids, very common finds in the 19th century. Um, mixing bowls, another thing very common. Uh, yellowware, still sold today, often with a contrasting slip inside. Um, quite shallow moulding, uh, it's quite distinctive, and these round oval and diamond patterns appear frequently. Another cheap and cheerful class of Victorian pottery is banded wares or annular wares where you have slip rings and bands either on a yellow musty coloured background or a blue background. Brown seems to be a common denominator to both of these. And jugs and mugs are the most popular items made with these wares, but also you get things like chamber pots uh, as well. Additional decoration on these banded wares uh, is mocha. So there is a sort of, they call it a tea, and it's made of different ingredients, and you just dot it drip it onto the slip and it branches out dendritically into these fabulous trees. You can also get seaweed patterns as well. Um, and these again, mugs and jugs, right through into the 20th century, often used in pubs, but very interesting. Let's have a look at stonewares now. Um, Favourites of mine, um, often used for humble purposes, storage, um, containing drinks, packaging, um, 101 different uses, primary uses and secondary uses. Um, before we have a look at that, it might be a good idea just to talk about um, how old pottery is when it's disposed of. Um, Victorian dumps, so things that are utilitarian, like um, kitchen wares, packaging, would be unlikely to be kept for more than five years and often very little time at all, um, as opposed to fine dining, bone china and useful things like stoneware jars, which had a good reuse value. You could use them 
to keep your dripping in or your pens or whatever you wanted to do, nuts and bolts. Um, and these would often be um, looked after, maybe only used on high days and holidays, and therefore their disposal might happen 25 years or even 50 years after they were made. And so even on a 1930s dump, you're likely to get older pieces. So stonewares, um, often these are either salt glazed or Bristol glazed. Now the salt glaze um, is thrown into the kiln and um, produces a nice decorative glaze. Um, the earlier pieces have this mottled effect um, but after about 1850, um, it was more common to have a smooth brown salt glaze and often dipped, the top part of a vessel would be dipped into an iron rich wash to give this brown finish. So ginger beers and ink bottles are given a salt glaze as well. The Bristol glaze was developed in 1835 and becomes increasingly more popular so that by the end of the century much more stuff is Bristol glazed than salt glazed. Um, Bristol glaze you have this cream coloured bottom dipped into the mustard coloured top there so very distinctive and used for a wide range of utilitarian products, storage jars, flagons, like this nice example from London, preserved jars, the groove around the rim enabled people to tie a cover onto it. So looking at some common stoneware shapes, perhaps the most common is the ginger beer with its blob top. Uh, these were all hand thrown, amazingly. Um, so you see throwing lines, it's easier to see inside on a broken example. Uh, but the output was tremendous. Uh, this piece has one million uh, impressed around the neck. Uh, it's probably to commemorate a single potter's one millionth bottle. Um, so you can imagine this probably took about 10 years to produce that many. Um, but the output of stoneware vessels was incredible in the Victorian period and the late Georgian period. So ginger beers, very popular, very common. Uh, um, a lot of stoneware bottles for drinks have maker's marks and that's often a useful hint towards the age. So the early and mid Victorian maker's marks are often quite large and take up a lot of the bottom of the bottle whereas later in the 19th century and into the 20th century makers marks are quite small. Um, other drinks were stored in stoneware bottles uh, with, with slightly different shapes so you get porters and mineral waters as well as hundreds of other household products. Uh, you also find uh, blacking bottles with this flared top or the cone shaped vessels which would have taken a paste, blacking paste, so for shoes, boots, grates, halves, um, ironwork, everything like that. Uh, food jars and preserved jars. Um, this is an interesting one because it's got these uh, three grooves on the lip and also that as well. So these were made to take a metal top, a screw top, uh, and were used for things, look, Bailey of Fulham, nice, uh, were used for perishable things such as caviar and more expensive items and sometimes they have the word patent and two letters there as well. This one made by Stephen Green of Lambeth. Cream jugs um, handled or unhandled 
uh, in stoneware with a lustrous plain brown glaze sometimes marked on the bottom um, from the 1880s when pasteurization was introduced um, these cream pots became very popular and some of them are marked as well with the dairy's um, own advertising on them water filters are another thing that you find in stoneware or parts of water filters uh, with pierced stoneware inserts uh, there's a picture of a water filter here they were quite large things but uh, obviously useful in Victorian households uh, when your water quality was perhaps not as good as it could be Uh, and very humble things, you do get lots of salt glazed drain pipes uh, with their sort of um, rilling there to take the cement to hold the next pipe along in the row. Uh, these were made from 1850 onwards and are very common finds everywhere. You frequently encounter stoneware vessels with these weird hieroglyphs on them. Are they evidence of alien contact? or are they ancient Egyptian stoneware? Or were they made in Derbyshire? Derbyshire stoneware, of course, made through the 19th century, um, and these rouletted patterns of um, squares and rings and little hieroglyphs of different sorts, uh, very distinctive, uh, very lustrous chocolate coloured Plays, um, sometimes uh, with a different colour inside, um, this is probably going to be a mixing bowl, uh, and often on the bases, uh, partly glazed or unglazed, you get three pad marks where they were supported in the kiln. Ink bottles, very common in stoneware, uh, recognisable by the Pouring spout, uh, brown salt glaze and white glazed. Um, also individual ink, penny inks. I have got a couple, but I couldn't put my hands on one. So here's a photo. Decorative jugs in stoneware. These hunt jugs are very common. Uh, first made in the 18th century and they're sort of fossilized into the same range of motifs. Um, the earlier ones have sprigged, that is separate um, details molded in a, a metal mold and added to the body afterwards and the later ones are molded in one piece, um, cheaper and easier to make. Um, so you get lots of fragments of these hunt jugs. Um, slightly better quality, relief moulded jugs with a smear glaze that is uh, a very light salt glaze, so it doesn't obscure the detail. Um, often you have that sort of pecked background to the jugs there. These were made from the 1820s and are common throughout the whole Victorian period. Preserve jars in stoneware uh, with a groove below the neck for a cover and ribbed sides often with the maker's mark taking up the whole bottom. These are very common from the 1890s onwards right through to the 1930s. But the homegrown stoneware producers didn't have it all their own way. And so you do get a range of imported stonewares as well on dumps, uh, like these German mineral water bottles. Um, these are found throughout the 19th century. From 1879 onwards, uh, they were machine made. Before that, they were hand thrown. So you get the throwing rings on the side of the bottle, up the side of the bottle, and often wire marks where they were taken off the wheel, which you don't get on the later ones, which are extruded. They're more likely to have vertical lines, um, but quite nice 
you know, with details of the spring where the mineral water came from. Different varieties there. Um, simple handle. Often there's some details in a sort of German script under the handle. And they're very common right up to the First World War. Um, a sort of salmon coloured light stone, salt glaze stoneware outside and often a, a contrasting colour inside. The Polinaris is probably the most common type German mineral water. Quite a crude handle, so it often looks older than it is, but this is late Victorian or early 20th century. Some Chinese stonewares, um, mainly in the form of ginger jars, uh, globular, um, often with a rough area, sort of unglazed below the neck, um, sometimes with blue decoration. Uh, the lids are very crude and unglazed for these, um, so they're quite distinctive. I'll show you a photograph of one of those. So these again, late 19th century. In the south of the country, on the Channel Islands, you might get Normandy stoneware. Um, butter was often imported in these large, thick stoneware vessels. Um, they have a very obvious dark margin there, just below the surfaces, and a very metallic um, stoneware finish to them in the large, thick-walled vessels. Uh, Normandy stoneware, again, late 19th or early 20th century. Turning now to our last class of pottery, which is porcelain, um, soft paste porcelain, bone china. Um, by 1820, um, I think all the manufacturers in Britain had moved over to bone china production for tea services and dinner services, um, transfer printed or hand painted. Uh, fine, thin-walled china, so that often turns up. Hard paste porcelain, Chinese, Japanese, again normally quite delicate, tea wares, decorative items. Um, some of the Japanese ones, especially by the end of the 19th century, eggshell fine. The most commonly found hard paste porcelain is going to be the continental stuff made in Germany, Austria, uh, what is now the Czech Republic. Um, frequently souvenir wear, so a present from somewhere. Not necessarily seaside towns, but any town and village could have souvenir wear made for it and distinguished by a lot of gold leaf and luster decoration, pink luster, a lot of gilt, gilt decoration, moulded decoration, quite over the top, very cheap and cheerful. Um, from the late 1880s they would have been marked on the bottom with the country of origin or um, maybe a sign saying foreign. Um, they are also Figurines were made and fairings in this hard paste porcelain and um, from 1895 there was also uh, lithographed decoration which was good for flat large areas of colour um, but can rub off uh, over the glaze and so it rubs off quite easily uh, when you get dug examples. Anyway, I really hope you've enjoyed our little run through some Victorian pottery. These are the things you're most likely to encounter um, when you're field walking or walking along a riverbank or digging a dump. 
but hopefully it will give you a bit more appreciation of some of the broken things that you find um, and that you'll take some of them home and treasure them now that you understand a bit more about them. So hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye.